Good morning, Kindersley Alliance. How are you all doing today? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Ulrichson. My wife, Tara Lynn, and I are missionaries in Mexico, and uh, we're home on home assignment this year. We were um, out there in Kindersley visiting everybody a, few, or a little over a month ago, and we really enjoyed our time there, and we're really looking forward to being back there this weekend. But obviously, life and a uh, certain situation that we're all familiar with has um, Put a, a kibosh on those plans and so hopefully at some time in the near future we'll be able to get out there and see all of you but if not I guess uh, this will have to suffice for now. So I just wanted to make a couple of notes before um, we launch into this week's message. The first one, like many of you, I am working from home. In this case, not exactly from home. Uh, we're on vacation. We're sort of self-isolated in a uh, a setting that is not our home, but regardless, the kids are around, and uh, if there is any noise or if you hear any interruptions, my apologies for that, but hopefully we can keep those to a minimum. The second note is that this message does not specifically relate to the COVID-19 virus and the situation that we're facing. I'm assuming that Pete has already touched on that some, and uh, everybody's well aware of that, but uh, I think that there is something here that will um, will tie in with everything that we're going through. So the question that I wanted to look at today is, who do you want to be? What is the type of person that you want to be? What is the type of person that I want to be? And if we really want to get a little bit more specific, what is the type of person we want to be in the middle of this type of crisis and this type of situation? Well, I think like most of you, I can uh, identify people in my life that I look at and go, I would really like to be like them. Now, some of them are the superstars and the heroes, Wayne Gretzky, those type of people that realistically most of us are never going to be. But there are other ones who, who stand out, especially when speaking about character and uh, our spiritual growth, that really speak to us and really um, stand out to us as people that we look at and go, I want to be like them. I want to be that type of person. I know in my own life, I think of three people who really jump out. The first one would be C.S. Lewis. I'm a huge fan of all of his works and um, just really have enjoyed reading him and his perspective and the depth that he brings to thoughts, especially to Christian thoughts. And uh, he's just always been very influential in my life. And especially as I read about the type of person that he was, it wasn't just that he was a great author, it seems like he was legitimately a, an incredible person. The second one that jumps to mind is somebody like Billy Graham as, as a preacher, as a minister of the gospel, certainly uh, somebody who spoke to thousands, millions of people, uh, stands out. And again, it's not just a matter of the ministry that he had, it's a matter of the type of person that he was. And the third person is a much more personal example. Um, and that would be my grandfather. Really, I could say all of my grandparents, because all of my grandparents were really godly people, people who really loved the Lord and who really followed his ways. Um, but my my mom's father in particular was somebody who um, really demonstrated uh, a love for God and really lived out his life in a way that um, I look at and go, yeah, if I could be anything like that, that would be pretty incredible. And I think all of us have those individuals that we identify and that we look at and go, um, man, as far as being a Christian and as far as following God, this is the type of person that I wish I was or that I would like to be. And uh, that is a good thing. We are called to imitate people that we would love to be like. And quite beyond just our own personal lives, I mean, we can go to Scripture itself and we find lots of people in Scripture that we look at and go, man, I would really like to be like him, like Abraham, the father of our faith, like Moses, who obeyed God and did all these incredible miracles, like David, who was called a man after God's own heart. Or if you jump to, oh, Daniel is another one who stands out to me, a man of incredible wisdom and uh, just did great things for God. Or if you jump to the New Testament, of course there's Jesus, who doesn't want to be like Jesus in some way. And the Apostle Paul, who took the gospel all over the place and uh, was just super passionate, or all of the apostles who were willing to live and to suffer and even to die eventually for their faith. And so we have this vast array of witnesses, this vast array of people that we would like to be like. And so the question is, what is there underneath that and how do we become like those people? 
as I was talking to Pete and talking about the possibility of coming back to Kindersley and, and what did he want me to speak on, he said he wanted to be looking at a series of books, of, of small books in the New Testament. Now, with everything going on, I don't know if that has continued, or maybe small books in the Bible. Um, but he threw a few options past me, and the one that really stood out to me was Third John. And I think that it has a lot to do with this question that we're looking at, or that I'm bringing up. What type of person do you want to be? So I just want to read Third John. It's a, a total of 15 verses. And so... Here it is, 3 John 1, reading from the English Standard Version. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who wants to, and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone, and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we'll, we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. And so we have a simple letter that is a contrast in many ways between two different individuals, and brings out this exhortation in verse 11, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. And it's a call to say, what type of person do you want to be? Who do you want to be like? Now, this seems to be the situation. It seems like there were a couple of brothers who went out in verse 6, maybe a couple, maybe a bunch, it's hard to say. Uh, verses 6 and 7, in 7 in particular, it says, for they have gone out for the sake of the name. And it seems like these brothers had gone out preaching the gospel, declaring the gospel in some form. We don't know a whole lot more about that, but that seems to be what has happened here. And as they have gone out, they have had a few different interactions. And we are introduced to two different people within this uh, this short little book. Three, really, because it speaks about Demetrius as another example that should be imitated, somebody who is spoken well of, but um, we're not going to focus much on him. The two individuals are Gaius and a guy named Diotrephes. I'm not 100% sure I'm saying that right, but that's what I'm going to go with. And they have totally different reactions to these brothers. We find in the beginning part that these brothers have come back and they're testifying to the love that Gaius has shown. They've come back to John's church and they've said, Gaius showed us love. He welcomed us. He blessed us. Even though we were strangers, he, he still welcomed and accepted us. And so Gaius is spoken of very well. On the other hand, we have Diotrephes, who has a very different testimony. John says to him, I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. And here we have Diotrephes talking wicked nonsense against the Apostle John, refusing to welcome these brothers, stopping others from welcoming them, and even putting others who want to welcome them out of the church. And so we have two very deeply contrasting figures, Gaius and Diotrephes. And the question that I was looking at is, as I was thinking about this was, what makes these two guys so different? And I think there are a couple phrases that stand out that really help us to understand this difference. The first one is what we find in verse 10, or verse 9, pardon me. It is a description of Diotrephes, and it says about him that he likes to put 
himself first. And I think this pretty much sums up the attitude and the motivation of Diotrephes. He is somebody who is, uh, I mean, he appears to be a leader in the church, so surely he's heard the gospel. Surely he would say, we assume that he believes in Jesus, and yet his life doesn't reflect that. His actions are other. He is more concerned about himself than he is about God, than he is about the gospel, than he is about these brothers. He has allowed, in some way, selfishness to consume him. And this has really been the sum total of the sinful nature and of what we describe as sinful throughout the whole of human church, of, of the Christian church and, and the scriptures that we have. It is us setting ourselves up in opposition to God. It is us thinking about ourselves rather than thinking about others. And this seems to be the description that we have of Diotrephes, and we see that his actions flow out of that. On the other hand, we have Gaius. And Gaius, the, the phrase that it uses there is an interesting one. In verses 3 and 4, it says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And so in contrast to uh, Diotrephes, who is only thinking about himself, we have Gaius, who is walking in the truth. But what exactly does that mean? Now, some of it we could probably pick out from these particular uh, verses and the whole phrase, walking in the truth, and we'll do that in a moment. But I think as well that it's very helpful, knowing that we have other books from John, to go back and look at some of them. And if we go back and read in particular 1 John, which is a much more in-depth uh, letter from John, I think we get a lot of the answers and a lot of description of what this idea means. And so what do we find? Well, first of all, we find the concept of truth. And certainly that is there, and we look at that and say, well, that's a belief, that's a mental acknowledgement, or that's uh, something that guides our life. And we do find that truth um, talked about in 1 John, and we sort of intuitively know it as Christians, the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that we are called to confess him as Lord. And so we assume that is the truth, and, and sometimes we can kind of fixate on that part of things. But we see that the phrase isn't just that he knows the truth, but that he's walking in the truth. And so we see that Gaius, in some way, his life is living out this truth. He has understood who Jesus is, and now he is living it out. He is walking in it. We see in this case that he has welcomed these brothers who are proclaiming the gospel. He has given them hospitality. He has shown them love in the middle of not really knowing who they are. And we see that in 1 John as well, where he talks about, if we love God, we will obey his commands. If you hate your brother, you're not really walking in the truth. And all sorts of expressions along those lines, where John is expressing this idea that it's not just about knowing the truth, it's about living the truth. And I think that brings us a long way, because we see the difference between Gaius and Diotrephes. They both seem to be aware of Jesus, but one is living the truth and one is not. And so that takes us a long way. But I think there's something even a little bit deeper than that. Because what really allows Gaius to walk in the truth? You see, it's, it's perfectly fine and it's really easy to say, okay, well, we should just obey God. And we all agree with that, that yes, we should obey God, we should obey Jesus. But it's not always that easy. And so how do we get there? How do we go about doing that? What is the real contrast between Gaius walking in the truth and um, Diotrephes, who's being selfish? And I think even that expression of Diotrephes as being selfish and being thinking only about himself can help us to dig just a little bit deeper. Because underneath that, we find a person who is thinking only about himself, loving himself, and doing what he wants to do. Diotrephes, on the other hand, what is his motivation for walking in the truth? Why is he doing that? And I would argue that the reason that he is able to walk in the truth 
is because he has understood and knows the love of God. And out of that love, he is seeking and desiring to do the will of God. If we jump back into the book of 1 John, we find that John was indeed very aware of the love of God towards him. And as a result, he loved God in return. We find in 1 John 4, 9 and 10, it says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you jump forward just a little bit further, he says it very clearly, We love because he first loved us. If we jump back a little bit further, I'm just kind of going in reverse order, we find in 1 John 3, 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And so we have in the, first, in the book of 1 John, this awareness of just how deep God's love towards us was and everything that he did for us. And as a result, there is a deep love that John has for God. And it is this love that spurs him on, that motivates him to walk in the truth. And all of his, his comments about we should obey his commands flow out of this understanding that God loves us and flows out of a deep love for God. If I think back of some of the people that I mentioned, whether it's C.S. Lewis or, or um, Billy Graham or my grandfather, what defines them is not just the great things that they did, but that there was a deep love for God. The things that they did flowed out of their love for God. And I think there's another step even beyond that. If we jump back to 1 John 2, or, or maybe not a first step, I think there's a result that flows from that love of God. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the wor world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with, with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. To me, it's absolutely fascinating that there he ties in living forever with doing the will of God. And I don't think he's just talking about accepting Jesus. I think that he's talking about something bigger, something where we come to know and understand who God is and love him for who he is. And because of that, we want to do what he calls us to do. You see, we find this idea of the will of God all the way through Scripture. We find it in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. We identify that as them saying, no, I would rather do things my way than your way, and sin entering the world because of that. We find that in the life of Jesus, where he says, not my will be done, but yours. And, of course, when we get to heaven... I think this is sort of the defining feature of heaven, is that God will be God and people will be doing his will instead of their own. If we get up to heaven and each one of us is still trying to do our own will, we're trying to do our own thing, we're trying to control our own life, heaven is going to be absolutely no different than life down here on earth. The change that needs to happen and can start to happen now is this recognition that God's will is good and that what God wants for us is good. Sometimes when we think of obeying other people or doing what they want, we get all uptight because our will says, I want to be in control, I want to be in charge, and we're worried about what somebody else being in charge is going to mean for us. But if we look at who God is, I mean, he loved us, he died for us, he sent his son for us, we know that he is a loving God and his will is good and pleasing, not just for us personally, but for all of the people around us. And so I think when we find somebody like Gaius, we find that he is walking in the truth, not because he's just trying really hard, but because he has come to understand the love of God 
and out of his own love for God, he is willing and desiring to do the will of God. So what does this mean for us? I have found the most practical way to incorporate these ideas into my life is through something that Jesus gave us that we all know about called the Lord's Prayer. As we walk through the Lord's Prayer, I think there is something incredibly valuable and incredibly helpful for us. You see, the beginning of it starts, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And really what we do as we enter into that, and what I've learned to do as I begin to follow this myself, is to reflect on and to think about God, all that he has done for me, and all that he is. And as I do so, my love grows. You see, it, right within that phrase is the idea of God as our Father. And as we reflect on that, we come to know him better. But it's far beyond that. As we reflect on all that God is, whether that is creator or whether it is our provider or whether it is our protector or the many different descriptions of him or whether we focus on the life of Jesus, who is the revelation of the Father and his life, how he loved people, how he healed people, how he cared for those around him, eventually how he died for us, eventually his power when he came back uh, from the dead and all of who Jesus is. As we incorporate that and reflect on who he is, we should, in theory, and, and what I have found to be true, is we grow in our love for him. And that leads us directly into the next phrase, which is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I have found this phrase to be absolutely revolutionary, for a lack of better word, as I approach life and as I begin to pray this and I've incorporated this as my daily prayer because this has really helped me out of love for God to say how am I lining my life up with God's will and therefore becoming the type of person that God wants me to be and that I need to be in this world where so many of us have issues and I have found that I've been able to do this by asking three questions. The first question is, I think about this and God's will. The first question is, God, what do you have before me today? Because each and every day we are faced with tasks, many of which we know ahead of time, whether that's going to work, whether that's interacting with our kids or our wife or running errands or whatever it might be. And as I look at those and say, God, what do you have for me? I view them through God's eyes and say, okay, how do I go about doing these faithfully and in a way that will bring honor to God and that will allow his kingdom to expand? And beyond that, it's been able to help me to say, okay, God, what else do you have planned for me that I'm not expecting and help me to be ready for that? The second question that I've asked is who? We are relational people and really, um, you know, so much of the, the love that we are called to share, most of it has to do with other people. And so the second question is, who will I be interacting with today? Or who have you called me to minister today? Oftentimes that starts with my kids and with my wife and saying, God, how do I love them? How do I show your love to them? How do I serve them? doesn't mean I always do a great job, but asking the question helps me to start focusing my heart and my attention on that. And again, who else do you want me to pray for? Who else do you want me to reach out to who needs to know about you and your love? And the third question that is tied up with all of these is just that question of how. How do I live out the gospel? How do I show the fruit of the Spirit, which I found to be a very helpful focus point, and how do I um, not just minister to these people and do these tasks, but how do I do them in such a way that your name is glorified. And it has been an incredibly practical tool for me to, to say, what does it look like for me to walk in the truth, to walk in the light, to help me become the type of person that God has called me to be? It has mean, meant that at times I have um, changed my plans. At times I have had to give up what I wanted to do or what I was expecting to do 
because I've become more aware of what God wants me to do. I mean, as you carry on in the Lord's Prayer, you get to that part where it says, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who have sinned or trespassed against me. And sometimes I have to think back about the previous day and recognize, nope, there were times when I totally missed it and we're all going to have those. But I've seen incredible growth in my life in terms of loving God and in terms of actually figuring out how do I live out the gospel and be the type of person that I'm called to be. And so my question for you would be, what does this mean for you? More than anything, I would like to challenge you to take up this prayer. If you haven't memorized it, as I'm sure most of you have, memorize it and make it part of your daily life and take some time to focus on God and loving him and especially significant time to say, God, what is your will for me today? What do you want me to do? It might be practical things in your day-to-day -day life. It might be stuff that you're not expecting. It might be, for us, we've got all sorts of questions about Mexico, and are we going back to Mexico? I don't know, or exactly when are we going back to Mexico? But as I say, God, your will be done, I'm able to leave that in his hands and say, okay, we'll just sort of take things one day at a time. With this whole coronavirus thing all around us, what does it mean for you? What does it mean for me to say, God, what is your will for me today? It might mean that we say, God wants me to live without fear. And rather than, than living in fear, we are living in hope and trust that God will walk us through this, regardless of the difficult circumstances we might be facing, uh, whether that's a job loss or whether that's hard economic situations or whether it's just going crazy like I've heard Pete is because he's stuck, he, he can't interact with people the way he would like. But we live without fear. On the other hand, maybe God is calling you to say, you know, rather than fighting against this, as some of us tend to, maybe I need to show love for other people by isolating myself a little bit more, by respecting the fear that others do have. I, I won't live in fear, but I will acknowledge and show compassion for the fear that others have. Or maybe it means trusting God when finances are tight. On the other side of things, maybe we've, you've still got a stable job and God is calling you to release some of your finances to help and bless other people. Or it could be something completely unrelated to the, the virus and the situation that we are facing right now. Just in your day-to-day -day life, interacting with your kids, with your family, with your job, to say, God, who am I witnessing to? Who am I impacting today? How am I living for the kingdom of God? What are the things that you are called to, have called me to do? You know, like I said, I think the defining factor of heaven will be the presence of God and all of us as his people willingly serving him because we experience his love and we see that his will is good and pleasing. And in love for him, we will do his will, which isn't cleaning the floors and, and doing all his dirty errands, but it is becoming the people that we have called us to be. It is doing the things that he created us to do. But I don't think we have to wait until heaven to start doing that. I think that we can start walking in the truth as Gaius did today, living for God, loving him, doing his will. And so that is the message that I have for you, that is the hope that I have for you. That as you go from here, you would learn to listen, both individually and collectively, to the will of God, and out of love for him, seek to fulfill that every day. Because I think as we all do that, we can make a huge difference in our community and in our world. God bless, and hopefully we'll get the chance to visit with you and see you sometime in the near future.